Okay, so um, I'm gonna do this in English because it's a little bit more uh, easy for me. Um, so good morning everyone, thank you for coming in. Um, my name is Sergio and probably the first memory that, that I have is of when I was four years old, about this high over here. And um, I remember that I was fishing pirangas in uh, the Amazon River with, uh, with my family. Um, I remember that I didn't catch any sort of fish whatsoever, and that was a bummer. Uh, but I do remember from that trip uh, that I was in the boat, and uh, I have a fuzzy memory as well of, for example, the hotel door room doors that they had. Um, some animals carved in a, a plate, a wooden plate. Like I remember that the room numbers had uh, a jag one had a jaguar on top, another one had like a parrot, uh, and another one a gorilla as well. So it's like it's a bit fuzzy. But then, but then there's also another memory that I have that uh, we were having lunch at this long uh, cantina type of table, you know? Um, and we were just talking and then suddenly the waiters just started coming in like very professional. And they started having, uh, carrying on this big plates uh, with the, a silver dome on top of them. And once they put it in front of us, like, uh, and they started removing the lid, we started slowly seeing what was beyond there and there it was a pair of juicy brains monkey brains in front of us well the, the truth is that this last memory didn't happen it, it was for some reason whenever i think about this trip to to the uh, to the amazon river i i always my brain always mixes up with the indiana jones movie this is this is very weird but um, fortunately, we have photos like this and videos that my dad is usually uh, recorded whenever we had these trips. And um, I mean, birthdays, christenings, any sort of event, he was there with his Sony Handicap just recording everything. And um, so the, the result is like we have a bunch of old tapes at home uh, that are just gathering dust. And um, even though that this wasn't from an event, this was, um, this was a video that was in that box full of tapes. And um, that's basically me trying to ride a bike. Um, so whenever I first uh, look at this video, this footage of me, um, I, I just there's a whole set of events and a whole set of thoughts that come to my mind. And first and foremost, why didn't I pedal? It's like, it's so ridiculous. I can see my brother going above and beyond, just like going crazy nuts just to make me pedal just once. But there I was, just standing cool as a cucumber and just trying to look pretty to the camera, right? <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, adorable. Uh, my girlfriend says the same. Um, either ways, and then she asks, Dear God, Sergio, what happened to you? Um, either ways, basically, afterwards, I cannot help uh, to think also about how simple life was back then and um, how I wish to go back to that time and just relive that moment and see everything as it was and uh, go to this uh, go to my uh, go to my garage play with my brothers because whenever i'm looking at this footage i'm also like thinking about uh, how i feel like a detective and just just try to see how my life was impacted uh, with everything that i've lived through and it's it's in whenever i look at these memories, these, these videos, it's a nice place for me to make some sort of self-reflection as well. I can see myself where I, who I am, 
who I was and who I want to become as well. So it's, it's and then it's, it's always that feeling again of, damn it, I wish I was there again. Like what happened to my life? Uh, everything was so simple back then. I think there's always this feeling of nostalgia in all of us that uh, inevitably every human being has it and at some point in their life that they just want to go back, back to that moment. And uh, even though the photos and videos, they're nice to, to try and have that feeling, they don't actually just, they don't allow you to, to be transported there. They don't allow you they don't capture the, quite capture the environment, the everything that you were feeling at that moment. So, but with virtual reality, that's a bit different. With virtual reality, basically, it's it's a technology that allows you to get transported anywhere, and suddenly you have uh, the power to pick up your memories, dust them off, and experience them one more time. And that's very powerful. And realizing this potential uh, for, for society, um, I joined Quora Virtual Reality. So for those of you that don't know, Quora is uh, the world's first fully dedicated virtual reality shop. And uh, it's also a um, an innovation hub for people uh, in Copenhagen to try come in and, and try virtual reality for, for, for their own and think about the wildest imaginations that it, you can have and can do with virtual reality and uh, we're also a production house that is focusing on producing content 360 videos and 3D animations for virtual reality but we're focusing on creating content with a real purpose with that's not something gimmicky but it's that wants to to do something and use this medium in a very purposeful way for our society as well um, we've had a wide range of projects ranging from uh, marketing uh, to uh, education um, and arts so it's a very wide range and um, we've Lately, we've been collaborating with, uh, with, uh, with key partners in the healthcare industry to explore a little bit more the topic of mental uh, healthcare as well. And uh, one of the, the, um, the potentials that we saw was um, with recreating memories uh, for dementia patients. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk to you about two cases today. Um, so one of them, the first, the first one that I want to talk to you about, it's the case of Bente uh, and Silke. So Bente is the, the old lady in the right, and uh, she, used to, she, she remembers very vividly um, about, going, uh, um, about going home to, uh, sorry, going around town uh, with her granddaughter. Which is something really we uh, weird because usually with uh, oh I forgot to mention she's a dementia patient. Uh, what that means is with dementia we have uh, a, the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, which I think you are all familiarized with. But it's basically a disease that it's so nefastous that basically it rips away your memories and just l leaves you hanging with a few set of them and. For Bente, one of her most precious memories was just like going around town with her granddaughter and she wanted to cherish that moment. She wanted to protect that moment and, and relive it uh, if she could over and over again. And the truth is like time is inevitable and the, the granddaughter will grow old as well. And perhaps she won't recognize her in the future. So uh, what we did in this project was basically we packed uh, a 360 camera in our backpack and uh, we met with the granddaughter, Silke, and we went around town and shot a video of just going uh, through all of those places that they used to go um, and that was familiar for them. And it was a very 
powerful moment for her as well, because um, suddenly it, she, well, she took it as an experience as well. And um, and for example, this moment right here, it's uh, it was also a pivotal one because uh, this was basically in the end when when she was saying like goodbye, grandma, see you tomorrow, and then she gave the camera a hug and a kiss very weird way in a very weird way but it was very cute and and for for Bente was also very powerful because uh, she was basically when she was watching the video she was being a knowledge of the presence like it was making her presence in that memory a lot more vivid as well um, so that was also very powerful and that's why perhaps she also took it a lot like an experience and the word experience taking these memories as an experience is very key here because we're we're talking about um uh, it's it's not just um looking at a, at a video it's suddenly living it and it's suddenly acting as if you are there. It's suddenly acting as if you are present. And somehow it's like it's hacking your primal brain and making you do things uh, as, as if you were there. Um, so th this, is, this is key in, 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 that, in that part of the process as well. But still, um, this is a very powerful experience for Bente in the afterwards, in the aftermath, and I'll talk a little bit um, uh, more about the outcomes. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the other case, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is an 83-year-old woman, and um, she used to be a church choir singer uh, for a long, long time in her life, but unfortunately, um, due to the Alzheimer's disease um, that she got diagnosed, she no longer could go to the um, uh, go out and visit the same church that she used to. So, um, so basically, that part just remained a distant memory, uh, and still one of her most precious ones that she still cherishes. Um, so, what we did was basically to go back to the to the church. Uh, the same church that she used to go um, and then just film a church choir experience and basically I could tell you how she reacted but I think that it's just way better if I show you. So, um, yeah, uh, you can see that this is also a very unique experience for her. Um, and, and the truth is that right after Bente and, and Elizabeth uh, watch these memories of her, like relive their memories, they were, they were able to recall for a short period of time um, a little bit more uh, of, from their past than, than they did before. Like they suddenly start remembering things that they couldn't before. So it's uh, even though that it was only for a very short time, I think that that was still pretty precious. Um, another key takeaway from this uh, project was also because it was also um, for uh, the experience part. When when we suddenly started taking um, these memories and showcasing it to other dementia patients that had never stepped foot on church choir before or they didn't have a granddaughter. Um, but they recognized, for example, the places that, uh, uh, that, that the, the Bente and, Grand, and Silke went for a walk, for example. Um, 
the thing is that they started um, feeling they, they actually liked the experience they actually thought that they were that was a nice experience just to be in the middle of a church choir and and sing again or just be in the middle of the woods with um, with a little a, a young young lady so I think that was that was also a very um, key part in this because uh, suddenly we started realizing that this is this was also very powerful for anyone without uh, like if you create these sort of experiences these very small experiences of like just touring around town or uh, doing like an activity such as going to the opera or uh, going to a concert just for for them for for them to be able to do that from the elderly homes that's very powerful because most of them they cannot go out without supervision and uh, most of them they can feel they start feeling stressed and anxious about the space that they are in and sometimes they even have like bad reactions towards the caretakers so the thing is that we um, when once they are in the virtual reality memories or in this virtual reality experiences they end up uh, feeling a lot more calmer and and at the same time they have that feeling that they're out they're someplace else and that eases them and gives them a lot a lot more life quality um, so what we're doing right now like we're, we've developed these kits um, with um, the basically can uh, enable um, the uh, the caretakers to take these people out on trips and uh, and enable them to um, uh, to showcase them and record other experiences for them. Um, we have also developed an app where they can upload all of these experiences um, and show them to multiple patients at the same time. Um, so it's it's also when once I start looking at these people these these cases I just can't help to think about like what about what if, if it was you like uh, what sort of memories do you want would you like to cherish before um, I don't know if if your mind was slowly going away like what sort of memories would you choose to hang on to? What sort of today's events would you like to hold on to? And um, if you could relive any memory from your life, like what would it be? So I think that's pretty powerful. But it's the thing about this project is that it's um, this is a part of also another uh, big problem in in Denmark as well, and also in the world. But just going to focus a little bit on the Danish market for now. Um, in terms of mental illness, illnesses, like what we have uncovered with, um, uh, with also key, other key partners uh, who are involved in this, like, and who are specialists in the healthcare, um, in the healthcare industry, is that in Denmark, there's a lot more people are in, uh, getting diagnosed with mental illnesses and but these illnesses they can be cured and but it costs the states like 7.5 billion euros more or less every year because most of them like about 35 or 45 percent of working people in Denmark they have to uh, and of the sick leave sorry in in Denmark they have to uh, to go because of mental illnesses. So that's something that costs the state a lot. And most of the times it's like, it's also a matter of um, most of these diseases are not like, uh, you don't, you, you cannot, the state also doesn't uh, provide much support. Um, so such as for example, phobias and so on, like those sort of acute diseases. And uh, we saw also another opportunity in there and right now we're also dealing with projects that are treating phobias and anxiety and eating disorders, for instance. And um, uh, just to give you a small percent, like a, a, 
some some run, uh, some numbers is that uh, every fifth Dane. I mean, Denmark is not a big country. It's like five million uh, people, and to think about like that, in those five million people, every five, every fifth of them. Uh, they will be diagnosed with a mental uh, illness during their lifetime. I think that's a little bit worrisome. And, um, and the numbers, like, they, they're telling us that two, uh, 250,000 suffer from anxiety, from depression, uh, and then another 40,000, they are suffering from eating disorders. And when it comes to, for example, treating phobias, um, the way usually that People, whenever people go out and seek therapists, uh, the way that it goes is to, they need to also start uh, making them uh, feel comfortable with the fears. And that can go up to, like there's also a fear scale sort of, and uh, it can start with thinking just about a spider and that's like a, the smallest uh, fear rate. But then like once the spider starts crawling on, on your arm, then like the anxiety is much, much more intense. So what, what you have is like you have a therapist right now that usually starts to make you feel comfortable with all of these ideas, with all of this, uh, these sort of fears. And, um, and for example, uh, but right now what we are doing, it's like what we are seeing is that this, that is a very lengthy process and what, and right now, virtual reality is playing a huge role in shortening that process. And for example, and what that means is, for example, right now, the person can be exposed to their fears in a very safe environment. Uh, and even though the, those, fe those fears are not there, like the spider is not craw actually crawling up their hand, the therapist is enhancing that experience and the virtual reality goggles as well because it will look like the spider, like she will see a spider crawling up their hand even though it's not there and then the therapist also mimics like with a stick the movement of the spider and that will make the experience much more real and what happens in the brain it's like it's just a, the brain starts to get comfortable with the idea of the spider crawling up the heart. So right now that means that uh, that's going to happen with spiders, but it can also happen to, for example, if you're afraid of ducks, and um, which we are currently uh, working on a project uh, for that. Uh, or even if you are afraid of going out to public spaces, such as, for example, going out to um, the job center because you cannot, uh, you're afraid of social interactions and like tight spaces, like being in tight spaces with people. Um, so we can expose these people to, to their fears, such as, for example, the fear of flying and crashing, right? And so the potential is, is huge in this area. And what, what we have seen, what our key takeaways from our whole odyssey within the virtual reality healthcare industry is that um, virtual reality can increase uh, the patient's life quality, as we've seen with, with dementia patients. And it can also uh, help out with patient compliance rules, um, making them a little bit more eased out, uh, eased out, like in their own environments, or for example, helping them out to take pills. Right now we have, for example, virtual reality that it's being used to for example, in kids, like to, for them to be able to um, take away their pain, like to relieve their pain, pain symptoms by, for example, imagine that they're getting a shot, a vaccine, like they can put on the, uh, the headset and just go somewhere else. And, um, and that's helping also in that environment. And it's also a cost-effective treatment. In the future, we, we definitely believe that such diseases such as uh, treating phobias can start to become uh, s something that can be treated in our homes without the state needing to, to pay uh, for such treatments. Like all you need is just to buy an app and there you go, you're treating yourself, your fears. Um, and um, yeah, and, and at least like it's, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> 
uh, what we see is that, and also, for example, if we take a look at this last, um, at this last slide with, uh, with the World Health Organization quote, it says that more than 75% of people are suffering from mental, uh, who are suffering from mental disorders in the developing world, they receive no treatment or care. So the potential of having virtual reality treatment in this area, which we have seen that it's quite powerful, um, it's very wide and it's very big. And I think that it's, there's also a, a, an urgent need in our society for projects like these. So um, with that said, thank you very much. And I'm very open to questions that you might have. No, I, I do think um, augmented reality will, will play a role in, in that sense as well. Um, although I think right now, like our brains can, as, as you've said, for example, with, with the fact that you have, that you don't see a body in virtual reality, or if you see a body and it's not moving, it's, it feels also very weird. Um, I think that our brains are very, uh, can, can capture that very easily. And perhaps like we will start becoming a lot, a lot more used to the fact that we don't have a body per se, or perhaps we will start having a, a lot be a better um, uh, tools, such as for example, not right now with the Gear VR, you start having uh, a controller that basically you can see your hands in the virtual space, even though that it's, for example, 360 video, you can see your hands. And I think that's like, that's enhancing a little bit more the experience. Um, but the, to answer your question, I also believe that um, when, when it comes, for example, to augmented reality, it's also a matter of um, your brain also realizes that it's like, it's not there. It's like, it's um, uh, that, that spider, it's very um, mimicky. And, and I'm not entirely sure about if you start seeing something that it's very in high detail uh, and you start seeing suddenly like a 3D element on top of your arm. Like if you won't, your brain will still have that suspension of disbelief because it's like you, you'll notice like that, the, for example, it's very polygon shaped. For example, but if you do that in virtual reality, uh, where everything is polygon shaped, <laughs> then your brain can actually like be in the same mood, like oh, okay, so I'm in the polygon shaped world, and whoa, there's the spider here, and you know, I think that it's like uh, I'm a little bit um, unsure of how it will play out, but I do believe that, for example, so, uh, augmented reality could have an impact. Uh, in healthcare, for example, when it comes to uh, diagnosis of people, just being able to have a computer just like look you through and if once we start having like chips implanted on us, uh, we, will, we can, for example, start seeing like, oh, okay, your liver is kind of bad because uh, yesterday you, you drank too much. <laughs> Things like that, and that can, for example, help diagnose, uh, a doctor to diagnose that. Unfortunately, we didn't do um, a scientific paper on that. Like, we didn't work with uh, with any university on this. Uh, it was mainly with the communes and the, these. I believe that we also need a, a bigger um, a bigger study case for for such claims, like to be, uh, um, for example, the the short case, uh, the short term memory case, like the things, that part where they start remembering things from the past. I mean, it happened to these, to both of these ladies, but we don't know if it can happen with more. Uh, uh, I believe that. Uh, bum, 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 bum. It is, but so far I don't believe that we have uh, received uh, any inquiries in terms of that that direction, actually. Uh, but we would be open for that. <laughs> um, I have 
Mm-mm-mm-mm. It's just that I'm thinking in the kroners and I'm trying to uh, scale it down. I don't know. I believe that it, it should be around like 1,500 euros, uh, give it or take. I'm not entirely sure, but it's more or less that. Usually, like we we um, we we do the um, the partner ups with the with the pay, uh, with the elderly uh, care uh, takers, um, and we teach them how to shoot, and we teach them how to operate the camera, and then they are on the field, and they can use our platform to upload whatever their uh, experience they have created and upload it to the um, to the platform, and that's the way that we are kind of. Uh, juggling right now. Yeah. I do have a question, but I'm gonna answer John's question first. I study neuroscience and I'm a caretaker and I'm a presidential host. And I actually have a father who's doing a PhD on using virtual reality for dementia issues. And what they're seeing is that if they use virtual reality early in the morning or just three four minutes, they're improving their, their patient's mood for the whole day. And that is actually a university paper by the Nottingham University. So there is a lot of research for them. And the question I got is on the idea that you said that we could be treating phobias from home. I am quite reluctant to it because therapists have a lot of training just to be prepared in a wide variety of situations because when you're treating a phobia, because there is a phobia, many things can go wrong, even virtual reality. So I think virtual reality is a really, really good tool, but I cannot see it as the only good thing without a therapist. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a fair point, um, but uh, what I think is, uh, you'll start having like all of these programs, and I think people need to be sort of um, aware of their limits. And I mean, if people are not prone for, for example, treating a phobia, uh, then uh, most likely they are not willing to go one step ahead. And I mean, what you I think it will start to become, and, and we will start to do. It's like uh, first, we we need to equip these doctors, like, and that that has to become like some sort of a partnership, and um, uh, where where we basically start uh, equipping them with virtual with powerful tools to aid in their um, uh, in their mechanisms and their um, treatment treatment mechanisms, um, but then. On the long, long road, I'm, I'm just thinking that it's like, it's just a matter of time for, even though that it's not like going to be treat, it's not going to treat the whole society that is afraid of chickens, of dogs or whatever. Um, it's, it, if people are willing to do so and if, if, uh, if they want to do it on their own, I believe that we will start having a lot more of these because uh, Telehealth is an, an increasing uh, large theme in our society, and it's like it's saving the state billions of dollars. If people don't get checked in to an uh, to an hospital, for example, and I think you'll start having a lot more uh, money pour, getting poured in to such uh, solutions. And once you start, for example, having these sort of gamification elements and and and, uh, and therapeutic. Uh, processes uh, then I believe that uh, and with the care I mean the apps of course need to be defined with for example with with caretakers and with specialists in the area uh, but I believe that that sort of process can start to become a lot more like mo most of it can start to become done like from home like most of the work so that's that's more or less where I see that it's heading like mm, Perhaps it's not going to take away all of the people out of the hospital, like for treating phobias, but it's starting to uh, ta take part of those, like part of that treatment and taking it home. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much.